What I'd like to share with you is, is really my own experience in, in building two 20-inch telescopes. Uh, but I'm going to spend time really talking about the mirror production and the, the grinding of the mirrors and the, the various testing techniques that I've applied to them. In the process, I've, I've sort of developed what I believe is a slightly improved technique for the Foucault test. And uh, I would like, just like to share that kind of information with you. Uh, I'll be talking about the basic uh, processes uh, and so forth. Now, for many years, the, uh, a six-inch uh, mirror was really very much a standard. But in time, uh, things like 20-inch mirrors have really uh, come about. And uh, advanced amateurs also plan much larger uh, mirrors, like 14-inch mirrors are made by hand for what for, for, for it's worth. And uh, people are planning large. And then I don't know if any of you are aware of the Altaz Initiative, altazinitiative.org. There's a lot of very, very interesting work taking place there where people are talking about some rather large mirrors going up to two meters. In fact, they're even talking about three meters. The limitations only being what you can carry on a road in a, in a, in a transport vehicle. So, uh, and in fact, some of the mirrors they're talking about are foam glass type mirrors that float on water. So you can actually have rather thick and uh, lightweight mirrors. So it's all a rather interesting work. The, the Dobsonian mount has really made possible the construction of large, large transportable telescopes. Um, but they often, in order to make them practical, they need to have, uh, be rather fast. In other words, small F to D ratios. And of course, that uh, is, is not an easy thing uh, to figure. That is sort of the end result of, of my efforts. So I wanted to start with that, just to at least tell you that eventually a mirror does end up, end up in, a, in a telescope. And uh, this was at Scopex uh, 2011. And on the previous year, the one on the, on the left-hand side, I had actually had it at Scopex 2010. We, we did win an award. Is that the tank as well? Yes, I was going to say, that battle against my head is, is coincidental, by the way. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, th I think Pierre Lawrence, he actually sort of positioned me into that for some, for some reason. Anyway, the thing started off uh, with no light and two mirrors at that time. Two Pyrex mirrors that, that we imported. Uh, uh, so actually, why it's two mirrors, of course, why two telescopes is a, a friend and I decided we would be doing that. Although well, I ended up doing all the work throughout the whole process, but for, for many reasons. The... Um, the mirrors, the glass blanks were actually already a, a factory a diamond pre-ground to f4.5 because it didn't cost us all that much extra to do that and was all the, they were also fine annealed. Um, they were 48 millimeters thick so they, you can really class them as, as thin mirrors. And, um, but they had to be now further shaped uh, to, and, uh, by grinding, polishing and eventually uh, converting them into, uh, into a good paraboloid. Um, and pretty much standard processes that I followed in terms of uh, rough grinding uh, to get the mirror uh, to basically fit the tile tool because uh, often mirrors are ground uh, glass on glass but that's not a good idea. It's a waste of glass and one should rather just uh, these tile tools and I'll show you some detail later really work extremely well. And then one goes through the whole process of fine grinding with, with finer materials like uh, 220 grit smoothing with uh, micro grit, uh, which is an aluminium oxide, and eventually one polishes these things to, to a good sphere, uh, after which the correction then starts, a correction meaning parabolizing. Now, all, all such steps can actually be done both by machine and or, or, or by hand. Many people just do these things by hand. But I thought, we thought at that stage that, you know, for doing 220 inch mirrors is a bit of a slip by hand. Um, the first four steps. You know, so the grinding and polishing to a good sphere are, re are actually relatively easy to accomplish, even for, for large mirrors. But the figuring, the parabolizing and the correcting process was really a rather challenging one for, for me, certainly. Uh, probably because I hadn't had too much experience in this whole thing. In fact, before doing this, I had only made one mirror, a 10-inch mirror. So it was really a bit of a, a daunting task, but I was probably naive enough to, to, to have a go at this thing. Um, now, a regular testing, of course, throughout such a process is, is, is paramount, and, and that's a, an important aspect of the thing, and we'll, we'll be coming to that later. But for this, I, I had to build a special machine. Now, I had a washing machine that, uh, 
was I was falling over in the garage and my wife had threatened me to get rid of this thing or to put it to some use, which I did. And so this is a bit of a recycling of, of, of a washing machine. That's the central uh, component around which I built a frame. And uh, it's, it's based largely on, on, on a machine that I read up in the, in the ATM Volume 3 books. Uh, on, on the principles described there, the idea was to have the mirror free floating on top for most of the time. In other words, inside a holding cradle and, and allowing the mirror to freely rotate without any undue pressure, to, just to, to avoid the stigmatism. Uh, the, for thinner mirrors, if you, if you, if you work with them uh, facing up, there's always a chance of, of, of landing up with a stigmatism, which is very difficult to get rid of. And this here is really what the machine in, in, a, in a crowded corner of a garage, as you can see there. Um, there's the mirror on the tile grinding tool. It's in a crocodile frame that holds the mirror. And there's some skateboard wheels that, uh, that act as rollers. Um, often kids, when they come to, to have a look at this, they wonder why there are skateboards without wheels. <laughs> and, and, and that is really the cheapest way of getting some decent roller, uh, rollers for this kind of thing. Uh, this particular central frame had some had additional side frames with, it, with DC motors and a gearbox, chain drives and cranks. And, uh, so there's the main arm, side arm. Uh, there's a splash tray that I made from polycarbonate. And I also recycled an old PC power supply. PC power supply is actually quite useful things for giving you like 12 volts, 5 volts, and 3.3 3 volts at, at, large, at large current. So, so I found that quite, uh, quite a useful thing. Now, I built the machine to, to allow for, for, for various modifications, adaptations, and experimentation. Uh, Many of which only have evolved during the process because I, I with this uh, figuring process, I, I had lots of hassles, and um, so I had to make some changes and do other kinds of configurations and processes on, on, on the mirrors themselves to get rid of, of funnies, which I'll explain just now. And as I had very little sensible information, I really um, I couldn't use much of the, the manual type struts, which I did try them uh, and. Uh, there were some, some real difficulties uh, with those in terms of major zones uh, occurring. But so the machine really provided an opportunity to, to research some of these uh, issues, especially the use of the various sub-diameter laps uh, in controlling the, the outer edge of the mirror. Um, these were some of the other configurations that the, I could put the machine to. In other words, where those frames that um, would, uh, they could either be at right angles to each other or opposite, depending on what kind of motor one. Here was a, these cases here is where the mirror uh, was obviously facing up, but by that time it had already been, been uh, uh, reasonably well, well, it had been polished, and this was now part of the figuring process. So there were various arms that I had to build, various uh, sub diameter tools that face downwards on top of the mirror, and um, different kinds of motions that I could create. In other words, uh, sort of like the, the draper mode where we, we create ovoid motions across the mirror or you could uh, speed up the mirror by, by uh, uh, really could run fast but where the tool remains stationary and then the tool actually stationary in position but it rotates uh, in a sort of a hypercycloidal type motion and that, that also creates some, some, some polishing action in certain areas of, of the mirror. These were some, some other attempts uh, there's a 13 um, inch tool which I found quite successful for, for, for many of the operations. Some of the smaller tools didn't really always work so well, which I will show you the effects of, of those as, as we go along. Um, for grinding, a 20 inch uh, tile tool, it was really just porcelain tiles, bathroom tiles on top of, in this case I used hydrostone. Hydrostone is a casting material for, for, mold, for uh, figures and so on. But well, I could just as well have used concrete. The concrete would work just as well. The hydrostone is very, very expensive. So uh, if I ever did this again, I would actually just use plain good old concrete. Um, and as you can see, my statement there, never waste a piece of glass. Uh, you know, you'd rather use it for a mirror. The, the, the polishing laps were similarly made with, with a, um, a, a special uh, pitch. 
that gets fastened on top of the hydrostone base. Uh, on the, on the left-hand side is uh, just after the pitch blocks have been stuck onto the tool. Uh, on the other side is now after some, some action and you can see the cerium oxide uh, showing there through the, the, the mirror which had, had already been well polished by now. Well, this was part of the polishing process really with the mirror on top. Um, uh, I had a lot of pro problems with pitch. Pitch is really a strange thing to work with. And pitch is not always pitch. Um, I, I eventually just imported some decent pitch which then really solved most of my problems. Um, on the on the right hand side is is, is a, a, fin a tool at some stage towards the end cut into that shape, the uh, star shape, because that actually allows you to now start parabolizing the thing. It actually starts deepening the center of the mirror more than the outside, and in that way, one, one parabolizes the uh, the mirror. Uh, some sub diameter tools for figuring. Um, various shapes and sizes, and in order to create them eventually, after a lot of battling around, I actually decided to make some silicon rubber molds, which are not too difficult to make, and that really saves, saves a lot of trouble. Various different types, uh, on the right hand side is sort of a, a spiral type one, which I tried for, for, the, for the hypocycloidal action on, on top of the mirror, in other words, when the, the two rotates uh, in, in a sort of with the mirror rotating fast. Um, the left hand one was often, I'd never made a, a tool of that size. I, I used it for making smaller ones, rather. But it was, it was a useful mold for doing that. If we now just get into the testing, I think you all know that if you have a spherical mirror, light, light coming in from, from infinity, uh, on the outside of the mirror, that light actually focuses short because effectively the edge is a little bit filled around, relatively speaking. And the inside, and uh, around to the inside, so one effectively gets a, a longitudinal spherical aberration. I think that's, that's a well-known uh, thing about spherical mirrors. Similarly, uh, for a paraboloidal mirror, that all ends up at one point. Now, if one now places a light source at the center of curvature of a mirror, of a spherical mirror, all that light will return by nature of, of the geometry of that mirror to, to back to a single focus. If we do exactly the same with a paraboloidal mirror and where the light source is now placed at the center of curvature of the inside portion of the mirror, because remember a mirror, paraboloidal mirror doesn't have now a constant radius of curvature, but it's minimum at the center. Then uh, your outside uh, rays will effectively focus further away once uh, to, towards the middle of the mirror, closer by, and then of course at the very center they will focus there. And one gets now, for the paraboloidal mirror, a similar uh, longitudinal aberration. Now that longitudinal aberration, being able to measure that in relation to positions on the, on the, on the radial positions of the mirror, is actually forms the basis of, of measurement. Uh, in particular the, the Foucault test, which I will be coming to. Um, if we look at the depth of, of such a mirror, uh, there's a, a, a very simple parabolic formula that, that comes into play for that longitudinal aberration, rather. Um, for a fixed source case, in other words, the source can either be the light source can either be fixed or one can move it. Now, for a fixed source, the, the top formula is basically what applies, but the second term really one can ignore unless the mirrors are extremely fast. Uh, in the case of moving source, uh, that, uh, that distance for the longitudinal aberration actually halves. And what is interesting uh, and, a, and a useful result is that the shape of the mirror is actually described by exactly the same formula. That, that, is, that is useful for, for a number of reasons. Um, the sagitta, which is the depth of such a paraboloidal mirror, uh, if one looks at different size mirrors for different focal ratios, uh, you can see how, how it obviously it differs going to fast, large mirrors. In, in the case of the 4.5, 20-inch mirror, it's about seven millimeters that had to be dug out in, in, the, in, the, in the very rough grinding. Now, the, uh, 
I, that, of course, as I said, is, is also the, the moving source, longitudinal aberration for, for, for a fully paraboloized mirror. So, that's, so keep that distance in mind, that link. Um, the question is how much correction must be applied to, to, to a mirror to convert it from, from a, a spherical shape to, to paraboloid. And in the case of uh, a 4.5, a 4.5 20 inch mirror, it's only five and a half microns. So in other words, the actual change in shape is actually quite small. I mean, five microns, five and a half microns, is, is not an easy thing to measure. Yet, it's that five microns that results in the longitudinal aberration of seven millimeters, which is what one has to measure. And that, that equates to about almost 10 wavelengths correction that one has to do. Now that's the amount of correction. And you can see across that table, going from uh, small, slow mirrors across to fast, large mirrors, how the, the increase in difficulty, how much more, more correction has to be applied to these fast, large mirrors. Um, so, you know, like a six inch mirror, F10 is really, uh, can almost be left as a spherical mirror. That you, it would actually work quite well, but not uh, large, uh, fast mirrors. Now, all telescopes have a theoretical resolving limit that depends on the, on the aperture. I mean, now, at the focus, uh, the image of a star appears as a, as a concentric, uh, small, br uh, bright ring, uh, surrounded by concentric <coughs> rings of diminishing brightness, and of course, it would be airy disk, and which looks like it, and I'm sure most of you are aware of that. And it has a, a point, spread point spread function amplitude, which looks almost like, like an antenna uh, radiation pattern with the main lobe and side lobes, but those, those relate to the amplitudes of, of the rings. Now, of course, the, the significance of this is that it places a limitation on your resolution of, of any telescope. So, because it has a, it has a finite size, um, trying to resolve two bright uh, objects in the sky, ultimately, um, the, 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 if, they aren't, uh, if they're too close together, you, you can't resolve them in, in, in any imaging. Now, what's the size of that little airy disk? Well, it's actually quite tiny but significant though. And it's given by that formula, and it's actually a, f a function of the, of the F to D ratio of the, of the mirror, and not, not the aperture. In other words, the F to D ratio determines the size of that little um, airy disk. And in the case of an F4.5 mirror, it's actually only three microns. That's, that's the actual size, three microns. So that's it's quite tiny. Um, the the, the resolving power, however, that, that's, you have to divide out of the focal length in order to get the, the resolving angle. And, of course, it's, it's a function of, um, uh, of, of diameter. So the bigger the mirror, the, the, the better the resolving power, which is why everybody goes for big mirrors. Um, and as I said, it's a, that's our function of aperture. question is, how much correction must one apply to these uh, mirrors? Well, uh, if you have perfect optics, which is not realizable, 84% of the energy lies inside that little uh, airy disk spot, with a 16% outside uh, in the rings. And you won't achieve that, but the question, there are different criteria and limits for getting close to that. There's that uh, Franson limit, there's so-called uh, Rayleigh criteria, and at the very bottom end, you know, some of these light bucket telescopes don't have to be all that good. They can, one can get away with, with, uh, with less. Um, many commercial telescopes will only achieve a, a strail ratio of around about point eight. Not will achieve, that is how they make them and they sell them if they can achieve that. In, in my case, I, I aim for, for, for a strail ratio of about 0.95. I thought if I could get that, I'd be happy. Um, now, how does one do the testing on, on, on these mirrors? Well, there, there are a whole host of tests that can be done. And we're just not going to have time to go into any of these in, in any great detail. But I will talk about the FUCA test. Which, so that was a combination of those two, the, the FUCA and the Ronke screen test. is really what I've used throughout all my process. And they are actually extremely simple tests, and, but you can get 
uh, quite good results. Uh, an interesting test that is sort of very recent is called the Scotts test, but we won't have time to talk about that. Uh, but I, I see a very promising feature in that. It's a kind of test, it stands for Software Configurable Optical Test System. And it's a kind of thing, ideally, uh, in the end, you would be taking your laptop, creating pictures or, or, or lines on the screen, facing that onto your mirror, and with a camera, you'll be taking the reflective images, and with the right software, you will know exactly what the shape of that thing will be, in a, in a very simple arrangement like that, but we'll see. That is actually the Foucault test in its absolute simplicity. I mean, it's really uh, an extreme. All you need is a mirror. You need a point, pinpoint light uh, source, or, or a pinhole light source rather, a knife edge, a stage that can slide forwards and backwards and, and allow you to do some measurements on the position of that thing. So that guy, and of course you need an eye and a brain behind that. And what does that guy see? Well, very simply, if we look at the, the left hand picture, if the knife edge is at the center of, just outside the center of curvature, he says, uh, sees an, a shadow sliding in from the right hand side and it's a straight edge shadow. If we look at the right hand picture, if the knife edge is on the inside, he sees a shadow moving in the, uh, the other direction. It's also a straight edge in the case of a spherical mirror. And of course, if you're exactly at the center of curvature, of course, the whole thing just grays and darkens over quite evenly. And um, you, you can't see from which side it is. And it's a, that's a, it's a very good test for a, for a spherical mirror. You quickly see any deviations from that. If one looks at the spheric mirror, another one, this particular one shown here as in the example would have like two, two radii of curvature, R1 for the inside portion and R2 for the outside portion. If you now have your knife edge at that C1 position, you would effectively see an image uh, as shown there, comprising a combination of those two. Those three uh, images on the right, uh, left hand side is what we've just derived from the other, the other pictures. If the thing sh shifts out to, to null the outside uh, uh, portion of the mirror, one lands up with the, that image, China Zeta, which is a combination of those two. So that is sort of what one, what one sees. And, and, um, in the case of a paraboloidal mirror, um, starting off, let's say, on the outside of the radius of curvature of the outer zone, one effectively at that, you you eventually get into a position where you can null off the, the outer zone. In other words, there's like a, a gray area close to the, to the outer edge of the mirror. By the time you've moved it all the way in, you, you, one can see a nulling of the inside. And in between, anywhere in between those two positions, one has a series of images like that that look like a, like a sort of a dog bowl, you know, with or a crater-shaped image with a, a, a ridge on it, a nulled area, and, and, and that nulled area is of significance in some stuff that I will show you now. Um, so that's what you see, uh, but one now has to do some measurements. I mean, you have to measure that longitudinal position uh, of the knife, which against the radial uh, positions on the, on the actual mirror itself. Um, one requires a significant number of, of, of sufficient number of positions to properly characterize the surface. And of course, measured and calculated results have to be compared to, to see how much, uh, how close you are and uh, what additional correction one has to apply. The traditional methods actually use what are known as, as, as uh, uh, masks. Uh, 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 Kuda is, is, is one of the guys who came up with this idea, but there are other, other shapes as, as well. Um, and what it comprises is, 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 is a set of mask slots that have to be, in which one has to judge equal grain. But the problem with them is, is that they are very, they are subjective and they are difficult to judge because of diffraction bright, uh, rings or diffraction uh, lines that one gets inside the, inside the image. That is one such mask. It's an eight zone mask that I made. The, the, the top and bottom slots is really just there to, it's got, actually got a, a nylon thread across it to help align the knife edge when you move that in. The idea is to get the knife edge nicely centered. It mustn't be in too little or too far, and that, that tends to help that. But that's an eight slot. Because I wasn't happy just with eight positions, I went for an 11 
zone mask, but you have to make it in two, into two, two masks, one for the uh, odd zones and one for the even zones. If we now look at the actual test examples, this is now looking at the knife edge, and in this case, this is now with a, with a webcam uh, behind the knife edge, which we will come to now, and with the knife edge all the way out, so that's all you see. But as soon as you start moving in the knife edge uh, in its correct position, and you, one can now null the outer zones, and that, that's basically what you see. So this is a method now of establishing the position of the, of the knife edge in relation to the radial position on the mirror. So that's like equal nulling. But, but here you actually you have to judge equal brightness, e equal grayness on those two, which is actually not, not easy to do. If one uses a webcam, you can. I mean, you can actually stand and a number of people can stand in front of the screen and, and make a judgment. But whenever I look at this picture, I can never decide whether those things are, are equally bright anyway. Um, this is now, as the knife edge moves in, you would get other zones. This is now the sixth zone. Ultimately, you measure like, like the inside zones. You've now measured your eight zones. You have to repeat it a couple of times. And of course, those results are now used in a, in a, in a, in a calculation. This is just an example of the, of the other one. And um, just to give you some examples of what I mean by masks. So the purpose of the mask is to help you to, to judge these zones but the, the, the bright diffraction lines that one gets at the edges uh, makes the judgment of bright or grayness difficult, especially on the outside of the mirror, because not, the slots are, are narrow. And that makes it uh, very difficult to, to make a judgment of, of equal grayness. So there's a more modern approach to this whole thing uh, that actually gives you, it's, it's, it's an unlimited number of points. It's, it's a really a, a variable slot, one could call it that. Um, it's more objective, it's very convenient, it's reliable, and, and one can obtain repeatable measurements. And it's actually well suited to, to large uh, fast mirrors. Um, it's based on a guy by the name of Harold Suter's method, I call it, it was in one of the uh, ATM journals, number two, a number of years back, called Digital Life Edge Test Reduction. Now he used this, uh, Harold Suter used a, a video camera, a frame grabber to capture a series of images, and then they used the Photoshop to manipulate these pictures. Of, by manipulate, I mean you sort of split and splice the pictures in a particular way, which I'll go and show now, that, um, from which you can establish the actual uh, null. Um, in my case, I've actually modified a webcam that I placed behind the, the knife edge. And I also made a couple of improvements to the slitless tester. And I, I, I initially used a, a program called GIMP, which I think many of you would know, uh, in, to split and splice these images and to determine the null, null crosses. But I still found his method, the way it's done in this particular way, I found it time consuming and still subject to, to, or to, sub, to, to be subjective in judging grayness. So I've, I actually developed some, some software, because I couldn't find anything that would do the job that I wanted to do which in the end has made my job a, a, a lot uh, faster, and I'll show you the results of that now. So it's actually an improvement on, on his method. And uh, the digital analysis of, of images uh, provides other hidden information that is not, not visible uh, to the human eye. And as crude as it may look, there's my little tester. It's actually quite simple. It's got a, 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 a what I call a dial plate. That's something that I uh, added to the thing. It's got a knife edge, a lead stuck be, uh, lead behind it, and there's the ronky screen. Uh, the knife edge and the ronky screen are cover two holes, uh, a large hole and a small hole. Where the knife edge is, is um, ooh, where the knife edge is, um, is really two vertical holes, uh, and one needs to get them as close as possible to each other. Okay, the. the, the the various other items like adjustments uh, to be able to adjust the position. Um, the, the webcam is uh, sitting right behind there. I had to modify that by removing its lens and putting my own lens system in to get the right kind of magnification. And that dial plate does basically that. It's, it's really the knife edge in the slitless tester fits directly above uh, in front of, of that dial plate. The rocky screen, when I turn the plate, I can, I can get the rocky screen in front of it front of that. 
So it actually makes the testing quite, uh, quite uh, convenient, being able to do all of that. There's the mirror inside the telescope being tested, the mirrors on a, on, a, on a flotation system, and I can easily get access to the mirror at the back. I use the Ronke screen to, to do sort of a, a longitudinal alignment because the idea there is to uh, align the thing in such a way that you don't have to uh, fiddle with a knife edge every time you move the knife edge in, 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 longer, in the longer, it's long, lat, longitudinal position and, and take the, the, the various photos. There's a whole series of photos that, that are taken. Uh, the, the top left one is taken from the outside going across. Fixed intervals, quarter um, millimeter intervals. The 28 spaces there for the 29 photos, 28 times a quarter gives me the seven millimeters. So that covers the full aberrational, um, uh, longitudinal aberration. The, that's now typically, so each of those images now has to be analyzed. What you're trying to find is that zone there, the split and splice method, you actually split the, the photos, uh, flop it over, and that effectively, where those areas are, gives you the, uh, you can actually determine the null from judging now in those areas. Which are that Inside, you have to make a judgment as to where it actually crosses. Now, again, you have to judge grayness, and that's not an easy thing to do. So by the question I asked, after I'd done hundreds of these pictures, I thought, now, isn't there a better way of doing this? And I, developed a, I couldn't find a program that could do that for me, so I had to develop one in a program called in Delphi, which is a programming language. And this is basically what happened. I could pull in a, each picture by itself, take a profile across it, analyze all the, all the pixels, individual pixels, compute the intensity. Uh, I actually it wasn't just a single profile, the idea was I used about 20 adjacent profiles in order to get an averaging effect, ensemble averaging, and applied a polynomial filter to that data, uh, just to again get a smooth thing. And this is really what I got. I could get a forward profile. If I reverse that profile on itself, it's tantamount to cutting and splitting, splicing and splitting the picture, or splitting and splicing. And taking the difference allows me to get the null, a very, uh, you know, quite clear null. Because the whole thing is symmetrical, I only have to take one value, which is the, the left-hand null position. That's the only reading I need to take. Um, and the diffraction spikes at the edge also help me to calibrate my, my data, in other words, to find the width of the, of the mirror in the image. And the, th the thing is very as insensitive to misalignment because if I, if you take that red forward curve then move it to the right, then the, the reverse curve moves the same amount to the left and the crossover, although it's not at the same height, will always be in the same position. So, that, so the technique is actually insensitive uh, to, to, to that kind of misalignment. And I can I have a listing of the data and it's easy to read it off to you know, within half a pixel, not a, not a problem. All of that information, point for point, is then put onto a spreadsheet where I can compute now the, uh, the residual uh, longitudinal aberration, get a plot of that. And here's some initial and repeat tests uh, on the same day, but several hours from each other. Um, the differences there are probably just due to turbulence. Turbulence is actually quite a major problem with this kind of testing. Um, I can do a wavefront analysis from that same spreadsheet by doing a numerical integration of the slopes. Um, and just something about the, uh, the tolerance mask. If where those yellow lines cross, if that is the point that you want, where it can either be short or it can be too long. Now, if one places a limitation, a limit on that blurring effect that you get in the center there of twice the area disk, radius, we know the diameter of the area disk, <coughs> simple geometry one can derive I, I, I value for that as a so-called easy tolerance and one can halve that <coughs> to get a more demanding tolerance. Now, man, I just, yeah, just a couple, not too much. Can I? Have I got a minute, all right. Um, that, that's a nice way of looking at this, uh, at the, uh, the longitudinal aberration. And there's the tolerance mask at the bottom, the spheres at the very top, parabola at the bottom. One can transform this information and eventually I can plot it onto a, one can expand it on a spreadsheet, which makes it easy. 
and that allows one to, to do the, the um, to plot it inside and make it nice and visible. And as you can see, that tolerance is actually proportional to the uh, the area disk radius and inversely proportional to the radius of, of, of the position on a mirror. And that is what makes it very difficult for, for large, uh, fast mirrors. Um, there's the, the, there's all the tolerance masks on there. Eventually, the information is entered into some other program, I call uh, six tests from it. I can calculate other parameters. You can see the surface profile deviation there is within a couple of, of nanometers. <coughs> Strel ratio in this case of, of that kind of value. And this is on the way to the paraboloid, all the sort of difficulties in getting the thing from a sphere and getting it to fit inside that, that mask there. Uh, comparison of the two methods is uh, they took a Greek reasonably well, the split and splice method of the photos and using the program that I wrote. And to end off, um, this is what happens when you mess around uh, the mirror with, with very small sub-diameter tools, which is offered to recommend it by people. But again, showing the, 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 the sensitivity of, of the Foucault test, you can see these things quite well. So my time having run out, thank you very much. <laughs>